my name is Adam Lefkowitz. I'm a customer success manager here at Armory. And Armory helps companies unlock innovation through our continuous delivery platform. And as a customer success manager, I've been supporting uh, Earnin. And I'm really excited to be here today uh, with you because not only has the team been working that I've been working with done some really interesting things with their SDLC, but Earnin also helps people build, you know, financial success um, to, you know, do things like avoid overdrafts, pay their bills on time, and really build a better financial habits um, because their app helps them access pay that they've already earned instead of waiting for, you know, their paycheck, you know, two weeks later. So it's pretty cool. So today. Uh, Charles kind of introduced, um, you know, we're going to have a discussion around how the, the team at Earnin, you know, approach migrating from a monolithic app um, to, you know, containers utilizing Kubernetes with a focus on how they leveraged, you know, Armory and AWS to, to do that. Some of the key takeaways from the webinar today are going to be, you know, why it's important to increase visibility for teams to manage services effectively. Um, the, the, the strength of, you know, different deployment strategies such as, you know, one click rollbacks or, you know, blue green deployments, why being fully modularized with deployment as code matters and how to use various helm charts to support different, you know, pipeline use cases that you may have uh, at your organization. So let's go ahead. We're going to start with a, a presentation. Um, and before that, I'd like to do just kind of a quick intro and then turn it over to the team here. Uh, afterwards, as Charles mentioned, you know, we should have some time for Q&A, so submit those questions and we'll see if we can answer them here live. Um, so from the Earnin side, we have Vivek Balaguru and, and Song Chang, and then you know, from the AWS side, we have Theo Salvo. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to them to start with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Adam, uh, for the introduction and getting started here. And uh, we will get into Earnin's journey to secure and continuous delivery system. Uh, welcome, all the viewers here. So before we go in, um, Adam started with Yearning. So I would also start with uh, what we do in Yearning, actually. Yearning's mission is to build a financial system that works for all, all the people, actually. That's our mission. And the challenge that we have in the current financial system is that billions of dollars of wages are held within pay cycles, so employees don't get access to the wages right away. And there is high overdraft fees actually uh, in the financial system. Actually, people pay money, and it's really huge. Uh, that's what billions of dollars, as you see from the Forbes article. And it's also difficult to get credit if you don't have a good credit history, actually, right? And then if you get a, a loan uh, and a credit, that basically there's high interest that comes with it, actually. So that's where earning comes and where we build a system that works for all the people, irrespective of what your credit history is and who you are. And we have access to the earned wages so that uh, they could access the uh, money uh, whenever they want based on the working hours. And we also protect community members from overdraft fees and many more actually. So that's about the earning. So now we go back, go into the presentation of our CACD, uh, the main topic for the webinar. So why we are here actually. So before we go into the presentation, how we solved it, I wanted to present the challenges we had so that uh, you understand where we come from and we present it here so that many of you might have it and this could help you actually. So the challenges we had as DevOps team um, is that we didn't have a DevOps team like a year or two back and then that has to be formulated here and that came into the picture. and. We had an open source Terraform infrastructure and it solved some problems, but there are issues with it, like when we had to maintain state uh, between the um, AWS infrastructure due to the way uh, the codes were merged uh, without applying. So there are issues with that. And DevOps as a team, when we come in, we bring in standardization across the organization so that we have a framework in place so that everyone could use that actually. So that's DevOps standardization, very key part in this thing. So that was missing actually. And then we had so many tools, right? Within, once we don't have a standard in place, like there are so many tools, and I think this is quite common in uh, many places actually. And then we had a monolithic system that was based on a in-house uh, deployment setup that we had. And for microservices, we basically used uh, uh, Jenkins to do a uh, kubectl apply. And, and and it 
it uh, it comes with uh, some of the challenges actually and then uh, there are vis there was no real visibility for the full pipeline as such actually so you have to go through like uh, hop into here and there to see whether your deployment went through actually and then all the deployments were not automatic like we had to do some manual deployments using our sre team and then if you do manual deployments you have to do manual rollback right so so it was not like a, a complete uh, hands free deployment that we had and then uh, we didn't have fine grained access uh, to the deployments like um, how uh, who has who can do a part of a deployment and all it was like kind of a um, not a bit open uh, deployment model that we had actually so having all these issues uh, we had to work on a solution so we put our minds together and uh, evolved and this is what we came out with uh, these are the four pillars of our infrastructure now uh, what we have for ci cd actually right so in these four pillars that we have i will go over the first part the key part where our foundation is based on right so we talk about microservice and kubernetes so we standardized on amazon eks um, and and we work uh, very closely with aws and they have been actively helping us and uh, we have migrated all the microservices here and uh, it has helped us actually uh, in this uh, in this journey actually helped us a lot in this journey and i i touched upon uh, terraform as a uh, open source platform uh, and some of the issues that we have we also have terraform enterprise uh, so that the infrastructure as a code is in place and then basically it helps of setting up the eks clusters and roles and policies what not secrets were managed uh, by terraform enterprise and you have infrastructure as a code with that actually and we have github as the source control and then we are standardizing on github actions as a ca tool uh, going forward actually because it's close to our source control and it's started well actually and the final and the important piece of this CI cd is that armory helping us roll out a spinnaker actually and that has uh, been the the story that we are going to go more into it how we did and what we are going to do actually. so but basically these are the uh, main pillars of the of our architecture now what does armory did with us with spinnaker that uh, brings us the cd actually right so what are that that we had and how we solved it and how we worked right so this will be the highlights i would say um so let's go to the ones um dinghy modules is my is a term that people who are not used spinnaker or maybe might be new but you know pipelines as a code if you use jenkins you would have used groovy pipelines as a code and terraform is like pipelines. so similar to that uh, we have a dinghy uh, modules that we have in spinnaker and basically what uh, it is is like it's like brings us to maintain history and pipeline code along with the source code for developers actually right mm -hmm. and what it does is that other than all these things like uh there's the it avoids a steep learning curve for a developers when you onboard them to spinnaker ui that is like you introduce a new tool you have to learn everything but since we did this as a code uh, they just have to begin uh migrating their application by just modifying some values to variables Helm chart types and pipeline, and then they could use it actually. So that has really helped us actually. So that is one thing I would uh, say, one of the highlights of the Spinnaker that is a lot. And then, then there is this real UI. As I said, the challenges we had is like, when you do a microservice, right? You do a kubectl deploy, and then you need to know what's going to your Kubernetes cluster, kubectl pods and all this stuff, a view of what is going on at the pod. And at the same time, looking at the logs, what it is, and we have that UI that comes with Spinnaker that you have this full pipeline of the uh, pipeline, what's going on in the pipeline, what's happening in the pod level with the log level. And those things are very well captured in one so that it makes the uh, an engineer need not know all the Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes uh, skill set to understand what's going on. It makes it easier for him actually, right? So you could relate to this in your own organization, how it is actually if you give that. And then uh, one step further, like uh, uh, we the we have Datadog is our observability platform, and then it helps enhancing the logging and integration with Datadog. Um, I will go deep into it when I go to Canary Analysis and when we do analytics. Uh, this really helps actually, so that uh, we really know what we are deploying. Uh, the, uh, the analytics part tells us like the metrics that is involved in this one, and then it helps you there actually. So that's the deep integration work. And then key 
point in this whole thing is this deploy times, right? Uh, uh, it's a no-brainer. Like on an average, I'm talking on an average, we had three x improvement. But in some cases, critical cases, it was more than ten actually, right? So I don't have to go deep on like what gives like when you improve the speed at which you deploy, right? So what is used to be a like a five minute becomes like what used to be fifteen minutes becomes five minutes. You can see the smile in the developers that he can go and do other things that improves the productivity there actually straight away. And also key is that when we do migrations, right, and when we show engineers this new tool that we are rolling it out and they see this difference, it's easier to convince them to use them, right? That is no, they, they became your champion actually. And then uh, Spinnaker provides this one click rollbacks where you can go and then you can provide the rollback as fast as you could actually only. And then the extension of the deployment, uh, the one more challenge we had was all or nothing deployment where you'd go and if something fails, you have to roll back. We have this red black, uh, which comes with Spinnaker. And you go and deploy one set and see if it's stable, then switch the traffic to the new one, keep the one. And if something happens, you can roll back actually, right? So that is red black, we rolled it out. And then we are adding canary analysis on top of that uh, so that to make the deployment uh, much more uh, controlled actually and also better. So we did this uh, with the uh, small DevOps team, like two of us are here, two of, uh, four, we have two more people in the team. So we have four people supporting more than 100 engineers. Um, so basically we are two monoliths and then 40 plus microservices with 85 clients. We started this in a quarter and uh, then we understood and then we migrated to the next quarter actually. So now, um, how did we migrate this, right? So we have, I have a framework, a platform in place. We know what we are going to do, what Spinnaker brings. How do we do this uh, with what we have internally, right? So this is always a challenge when you migrate any anything uh, anything in software. So how this is how it worked for us, actually. So we picked up the, the core services. The core services can be standalone by themselves, that they give you a functionality or product that people could use. So we picked them up. Initially, we started with the manual pipeline so that we were also learning uh, as a DevOps as a team and we bring in new engineers. So we kept the manual pipelines and slowly moving to the modular. And then the stage one was the fundamental uh, part of a product. We picked them that brings the core of the microservices and rolled it out. We saw how it is and we started fixing things, uh, what is good. And we understood uh, Spinnaker better. We understood the flow of to use for our uh, services. And then stage two, we picked uh, all the dependent services uh, that are dependent on the basic basic services depends on so that uh, add more value to that. And when some of the challenges we see were like, uh, as like any other software organization, there will be more than one language by which uh, applications develop. Uh, so you have to make sure that uh, your pipeline takes care of that, including the components, how they are built, how they are test, so that you can pipeline can have this flow in this actually, right? And then we took that as a second step. And then as part of the third step is where we, as I said, there is a monolithic service that is running on EC2 instances. And we have to bring it in and and it, and then and it depended on both the stage one and stage two services. Actually, it was a bit challenging, but we got that as part of the stage three. And stage four is this when you bring everything together. Like we had some services as part of the uh, Kubernetes where it's not only web app. They were processes, they were cron jobs as part of that service. And so we kept them as the end so that we understand all this well, and then we brought them in actually. So that basically completes our uh, uh, migration stages actually. Now, uh, a, a bit deeper dive, I would, I would highlight like to hand over to Song. Uh, Song is the in-house uh, Spinnaker expert actually. So he did the most of the work understanding Spinnaker and how to deploy and all the stuff. We set up the basic thing for us. And, I would like to hand it over to Song. So. Thanks, Vivek. Hello, uh, my name is Song. And as mentioned, I'm one of the software engineers here at Ernin working with Vivek. Um, right now, we're going to take a deeper dive into our CE, how, what it looks like uh, from a code perspective and also from the Spinnaker UI perspective. So when we started out on this proof of concept journey, uh, there were a couple of things that we wanted to provide for the developers and also with, uh, for our team, uh, platform team, and specifically for the DevOps team. Um, one of the things that we wanted to provide uh, the developers with was consistent consistency <clears throat> because uh, if we 
we wanted to reduce confusion for developers as they set up their CI CD pipelines. Uh, reliability, because as they set up, set up these uh, CI CD pipelines, we want to ensure them that their pipeline is going to deploy their app successfully. And if there is a problem, it shouldn't be a problem with the pipeline. It should be a problem with the applications. And third, uh, repeatability. Uh, we want to provide the developers with tools that they can continually use uh, to deploy not just one microservice, but many of them. But also for the DevOps team, um, we wanted to provide uh, or ensure for ourselves some of these things. And number one being scalability. As mentioned before, uh, we're a team of four supporting 100 plus engineers. Uh, we need to ensure that we can support them uh, to the quality that you know the company expects. Uh, Number two, flexibility, uh, because we want to meet the demands of the product and also the developer's needs. And we want to provide them with enough you know, tools to innovate uh, within their tech stack. Uh, number three, uh, standardization, because you know, we need logging, we need APM slash monitoring, we need organization and quality in our applications. And lastly, not the least, uh, security, because we need to ensure that our app is performing uh, only what it needs to do uh, within our environment, within our inf infrastructure. And also really important, we need to protect our customers um, and also engineers from what they're not intending to do. Um, and so with those things in mind, uh, we want uh, our solution for CD was a combination of Helm and Armory Spinnaker. Um, to quickly define what they are, um, as most of you guys uh, know, Helm is a um, package manager for Kubernetes. And Ar Armory Spinnaker is a different uh, flavor of Spinnaker that Armory provides. And specifically, I put the word Dini here because that is one of the feature that Armory provides specifically. And it is the microservice amongst many other microservices if you deploy it, that provide code as pipeline feature. And as I'll talk about momentarily, Dini was one of the key features uh, that Ernie, we were looking for in our CD solution. So um, looking at our uh, repository, um, at a high level, uh, we wanted the developers to take ownership of their uh, apps. Uh, this is including their CI and also their CD. Uh, we wanted the developers to uh, uh, we want to de developer related code inside source control uh, so that we don't have to look anywhere else uh, to dig uh, where is our pipeline defined or how, how our deployments defined. We want all of that within the microservice repository. And once again, Helm and Dingy provided us what we want. Um, as we can see in the slide, our CD structure um, with Helm and Dingy allowed us to make it very nice and clean. Uh, there's only Helm and Dingy. And uh, one thing to note here is that the Dini file is the, Dini, it's the file that Dini microservice looks for every time you merge code uh, to write uh, or to define your pipeline as code. And we will see later that we'll see the contents of the Dini file, but also we'll see how that Dini file translates into the UI. Uh, before going into Dini, uh, let me talk quickly about Helm. Uh, we, we use Helm 3. Uh, mainly as our uh, manifest render. And then we have Spinnaker do all the deploying. So it works hand to hand. And using these Helm charts, uh, it allowed us to standardize across all of our environments, across all of our applications, um, and still provide, uh, because we're using Helm chart, we, st we still wanna uh, provide engineers with ad hoc configuration, ability so that they can you know, inject whatever they need to do to run their pipeline or deploy their applications. And because we've standardized in this way with the new file on Helm, it allowed us to um, uh, be ready uh, to roll out the uh, changes uh, from security teams, uh, platform teams, and site reliability teams in the case that we need to uh, yeah, make an urgent deploy that all of the all of the applications need to uh, uh, apply to, um, uh, and that's it for Helm. Um, now, looking at the Dini file, um, 
So this code snippet that you see here is part of the Dini file. We have another section that will display the other half. Uh, but as mentioned before, Dini file helps us with writing Spinnaker pipeline as code. And um, what this meant for us to reiterate is that we can, um, this meant that any repository is a single source of truth for each application from application perspective to the CI to CD. And here is the CD part. Um, so again, for us, this meant that if we can deploy a microservice, let's say microservice A with a specific Helm chart and a specific Dini module, module we'll talk about in a second, but this meant that if we can do that, uh, then we can follow the same convention uh, for every other microservice. And um, the reason for this is that we want developers to develop. We want developers to innovate instead of being bogged down by the complexity of CI, CD. And as you'll see later, our stages are somewhat complex. The one we'll show is not the most complex one, uh, but, the, but there are cases for more complex uh, pipelines. Um, but because we're using these modules, we can continue to reuse them as templates or uh, modules so that developers don't have to get confused and wonder what they have to use. And uh, one of the nice things about defining your pipeline, your CD pipeline as code is that, let's say, uh, I'll, use just, I'll use Vivek here. Let's say he comes in, makes a ad hoc or a manual change from the UI, and then um, that works for that particular run. Uh, but let's say I come in and I, I submit a new code. Um, what, what happens is that Dini file will always look at, a Dini will always look at the Dini file as the source of truth and whatever change you make manually on the UI, it will be overwritten. Uh, although that might sound like, oh, like we don't want that. Uh, but the, one of the advantage, advantages that we get is that if someone, um, we, we can always look at the repository, especially the Helm files and the Dini file to, to be the source of truth. And that's where, where all of our changes should go in. And this ensures that, hey, if it's not in code, it's all fair game. And, and from, from a DevOps perspective, we don't need to keep track of the pipelines in our memory, but rather go to the code itself. And that's where, uh, that's where uh, we know what we exactly have today. And going further into the Dini file, um, here we have the, the main core part of the Dini file. Um, one thing to note here in line 46, line 52 and 53 is that we heavily utilize uh, modules at Ernan. Um, to explain briefly, um, it, the JSON representation of the Spinnaker pipeline is a lot longer uh, than what you would have in a typical DNA file, uh, especially if you use modules. And we extensively use modules to save some time and also give the developers uh, decision as to which uh, pipeline process they want to use. Sometimes they want to deploy a web app. Sometimes they want to use uh, processors or they want to deploy only cron jobs. So we want to provide the, uh, the developers with those tools to deploy and they don't have to think about the complexity of the CD aspect. And to give you perspective, uh, again, like how much time the developers are saving, if for this example that I'm showing you, it's actually about 80, 80 to 90 lines of code uh, or JSON. Uh, if you go into the Spinnaker UI, if you choose to define your own JSON, it, it, for this particular example, it's about 850 lines of code to 900. And that's pretty consistent through uh, all of our applications. And uh, whether you go that route or if you go to the manual route, uh, as you'll see momentarily, our our pipelines are pretty complex. It it will it, it's very unlikely that it will save developers time uh, in defining their code. And so we've defined um, what our city looks like from a code perspective. Uh, now we're going into the UI to uh, take a look what what they define. And uh, we have a lot of other features that we wanted to share, but for the sake of time, I picked out a handful of them. Um, one of them being the pipeline as code and the manual judgment to production. And lastly, uh, one quick rollback as Vivek mentioned earlier. So uh, from the code snippet that you just saw, what that translates to is this, what you see here. 
Um, you see a bunch of green boxes, you see some gray boxes. Um, let me break this down a little bit for you. We, uh, from a, at a high level, this breaks down into different environments. Uh, first one being death, second one, second one being stage, and the last one being production. And the way we've broken out our D modules is, yeah, through environments. And you'll see if you read uh, the names of these stages, you notice that it's pretty consistent. You bake the manifest, you deploy it to whichever environment, and then we do a red black uh, deployment process. And if it fails, we have an automatic rollback. But if it succeeds, we go to the next environment, making sure to clean up our previous deployments and, and so forth. Um, let's see. One thing to mention here is that we do uh, bake in our in-house system tests and smoke tests, which is currently grayed out uh, in the box there, uh, but that's what it's for. And as we go along the pipeline, you'll see that there is an orange box to the right. And that is actually the step right before it goes to uh, production. Um, and as I show you here, it's a manual judgment stage. Um, so even though our deployment process for every environment is similar from dev to stage to prod, we wanted to give uh, granular control in our production environment because it is production. Uh, today, we include this manual judgment stage that halts the pipeline. It doesn't terminate it, but it halts it so that uh, it gives the developers some time to make a decision going into production. And it is at this point that owners of this microservice, they make a conscious decision uh, to deploy their latest code into production. And once they continue, uh, it will deploy to production and do the red black deployment. Uh, if you choose not, it will terminate then. Um, let's say in the case that we do decide to continue, we also add another feature, which is the one click rollback. So previously uh, we had a solution that um, with, with Jenkins that that had a very complex way of rolling back and it wasn't straightforward for the developers. And actually for the developers, when they had to roll back, it was forward rollback, not a true rollback. And so here we added the stage, another manual judgment to give the developers another option to uh, roll back after they deploy the production. And uh, the reasons for this are, there are many, uh, one of which I can share now is that if the app isn't performing to the quality or to the uh, to the level that the developers want from an APM perspective, they can come here, uh, let the uh, let the uh, deployment bake in a little bit, look at the charts, and make a conscious decision to roll back, even though you've deployed it to production. And in this way, um, the rollbacks are very easy and intuitive. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, actually, yeah, that's it. Um, and let's say in the case that the developer wants to roll back, uh, what happens in the background? And and one of the nice things that Spinnaker does is that there is a view from a cluster view. If you go to the UI, you can see uh, you can see uh, the current state of your deployment. So let's say. Uh, for this example, you're on version two of the replica set. Uh, you, that was already there, and we deployed this pipeline. What happens is that Spinnaker will uh, create a new replica set with a new image, and it will have it will be running on version three. Um, one thing to note here is that on the left side, uh, we were currently on version two. We deploy version three uh, in a red black deployment process. What we do is we make sure that traffic is no longer pointing to version two, but it is point, pointing to version three. And let's say we bake in for a couple minutes and we decide that we need to roll back because it's not performing well. Uh, you, you make that manual judgment, one click rollback. Uh, what happens is the traffic will switch back to version two, which is already running. We haven't deleted them. Uh, after you switch the traffic, we do some cleanup, uh, meaning we scale down the version three replica set and then we safely discard that. And that's what it looks like after you do a proper one-click rollback at, here at Earnin. Um, and that is it. Thank you for um, uh, following and sticking with me throughout the deeper dive. And I'm gonna hand it back to Vivek to talk a little bit more of the, uh, about Canary Pipeline, which I've not discussed, and our closing thoughts. 
thanks, Song, uh, for taking <coughs> deeper uh, into the code part of Dingy and Helm, actually. Uh, it's initially, it looks like maybe a bit complicated, but it is like within like two days, I think, uh, since we all are used to Helm in some form of YAML and all these files, like it should not be that hard, actually, just to give you um, that, but really help that. So now uh, I'll just touch up on certain things uh, which we talked about. Uh, so the song uh, showed up a work plan, or oh, sorry, a pipeline, which was like the basic one that has everything. I also talked about the Canary pipeline. So it is a slightly different and this adds more value, right? So you want to give a pipeline and give a confidence that this package that you're going to deploy has passed all the tests, uh, the metrics is really good, and then you're confident like deploying, it's a no-brainer to deploy because it's not going to fail because you have the data in hand before it. With a, with a simple set of uh, uh, deployment, you know what it is. So that's where this Canary comes in. So in the Canary, you see that uh, what we basically do in Canary is that we have a baseline uh, pod, in this case, in the microservice. Baseline pod is nothing but a pod that is going to run with the version that is already in production. And Canary, deploys a, a pod that's going to run in a new version, right? So if you see that we have a find artifact step, which basically finds you the version that's already running and giving you a, a baseline deployment. And then you're going to deploy the canary with the new version. And then once you compare them, a canary analysis on this, you pretty much know what is the delta, what is the issue before and before you roll out in a full blown deployment, actually. That's basically this pipeline uh, gives you uh, that is different than the uh, other standard pipelines that we have. But uh, we are rolling this out to other things so that uh, you have good control and we understand the deployments better. Um, now, uh, the next slide is about our production deployments, uh, what we have got uh, based on what we have done. So basically, the first quarter is when we analyzed, we rolled it out slowly, and the second quarter, what you see is when the rollout is done. And you can, the, the chart speaks for itself, but I'll just go into certain uh, details, actually. Uh, the incidents during prod deploy uh, really came down after uh, of, of all this uh, uh, deploys that we did, uh, of all the improvements we have done um, with what we have done actually. And we have migrated all the services, uh, Spinnaker uh, at this time. And then self-service deployments has continued to increase actually. And as you see from uh, the charts actually that uh, the deployment rate has also picked up like almost 50 percent then more than what it was in the first quarter and i would say we rolled out the new services as well but cd the faster deployments all the all the improvements we have done really help here actually and now coming to the next slide um so the results right the result speaks for itself actually um uh, so we have uh definitely uh, increased our deploys and Deployment time has come down uh, very well. Like as I said, the speed is 3x and 10x in some cases. Pipeline visibility, that's what is like. You have all the views that you don't have engineers jumping here and there. Increases the productivity, right? So the, the, at the end of all these things is that how much time you gained out of this whole thing, right? The faster a PR goes from check-in to the production, that is when the real win is actually. You give the time back to the developer, so that you could write more interesting features rather than debugging things which you might not fully understand, actually, right? And make it uh, much harder, uh, uh, make uh, life harder for a, a typical engineer in a day, actually. So that is basically what this gives us, so that your velocity rate increases, that is like. And then less rollbacks, because of all these things that we have, there are less rollbacks to deal with. And given that we have all this automated and we have all these rules in place, uh, now, the deploys are not handled anymore. Engineers have the power to deploy themselves. They can go to the prod and deploy because of all the confidence we have. And it basically sets the engineers free. And not but least, uh, we might not have touched more on it. We have SSO and RBAC enabled for the deployment so that we give permissions based on who can deploy what and what are the permissions they have in production. And we know what is going on in each pipeline, who presses the in case of where there's a manual judgment to someone to press it, we know who it is. And we keep track of, if we wanted to see what all happened in like last 30 days, who all deployed, everything is available to us. And what's next, right? So we have everything, right? So it's the next, next, uh, uh, next uh, what do you call, uh, 
next you will i think most of you would be here somewhere in cd and uh, now we are in the next uh, quarter like next game uh, next step in the game of cd what the point that we are trying to say is that we have this fundamental framework or platform in place once you have that whatever you build on top should be just like plugging it in and we have seen that already so we have two pieces coming in we are rolling out aws app mesh as a service mesh for our services and we didn't have to make much changes in what is we have that is a work in progress that is going on and progressive cd um uh, progressive cd is the uh, uh, next evolution in the cd where you control the traffic how it is flowing uh, we are moving towards that step and what we have done has helped us uh, to have this step forward help us in the next step of this journey actually and that is what we have and at this time i think uh, we are ready to take uh, questions and i think i have answered a couple of them but uh, if someone can facilitate the, the one with top words we can i can go over them thank you thank you for listening to us so far All right, thanks, Song. Thanks, Vivek, for going through that. Um, and thanks, everybody, for submitting some questions. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, see if we can get through some of these here uh, live on the webinar. Uh, so the first one, um, a 25 to 1 ratio for developers to DevOps teams seems high. Um, do, you, do you feel that's an, an appropriate level? And I'm kind of going to add, is, is that kind of due to you know, the strategy for the team or kind of out of necessity in the organization? So I, I think I answered that, but I'll, I'll reiterate that. That's an interesting question. Actually, it's pretty high, actually. But uh, DevOps, as a term, uh, it comes at different flavors. But here, we have a separate SRE, separate cloud ops who manages the infrastructure. And we, as DevOps, focus only on CI, CD, actually. Uh, so basically, so that is our uh, uh, DevOps, and basically it is it is crystal eye considering all this stuff. And then we work basically on the developer velocity, and then initially we do all these things, and that's where the migration comes. You gradually develop, you gradually train your developers, right? So we have a group of services, and then you make your uh, what do you call uh, 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 evangelists and engineers who understand this well, and they say, "Well, this really works," and then he becomes your uh, Evangelist in the engineering community and engineering is kind of thing, and then he will do most by himself. You set him free, actually. So he would be like doing all these things. He knows Helm, he knows Dingy, he knows how when he starts the service, he can guide other teams. Like, oh, this is very easy. I could help you guys and then do it. And this way, we are able to scale, actually. That is uh, how I would put that. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts on that? I, I can speak a little bit on that. Like, at some point, you have so many examples of new files and home, home charts and home values that other repositories are using, people or engineers end up reusing some of that, some of those examples to save, you know, time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, one of the important pieces that you talked about, Vivek, is, is having that um, evangelist or somebody that is is kind of, you know, carrying that, that message forward is, is super important for any type of you know, changes. So sounds good. All right. So um, maybe next question is, how many times has there been a choice to stop the production deployment? And was that, you know, a coding issue uh, or a business decision to stop it from going forward? So this is like, see, this is where the production deployment, this is where Canary comes in, right? So we rolled out Canary for sensitive deployments, right? Uh, like some things which you cannot have like a, a second of downtime, right? And then that basically the canary when it runs, it basically gives out to you the data that you need. And then it will tell you if there are bugs that didn't been captured during your process of CD, like your unit test and the stress and all this stuff, that basically will tell you, wow, this is not supposed to be rolled out. So you basically expose the analytics to the engineers by itself. So basically it stops the production deployment. That is, I would say the ideal uh, situation and we are making that happen actually. I would say that is the one thing which has stopped deployment because they've seen this uh, diff, diff and then say, uh, oh, that is something which we missed actually. And and Canary helps, right? So where does Canary help is that 
you can have your dev, you have your stage, but production, that is always a delta where there is slight difference and Canary will help you uh, help you reduce the gap and then help you there to make the decision if it's def definitely going to be an issue there. Right? That is all I would put it for that. Yeah, in fact, would you say that um, the Canary capabilities kind of catch a lot of the technical issues, but then, you know, I know that you do have a, a manual, you know, essentially manual judgment stage in there to maybe address some of the business deci decisions. Is that pretty fair to say, you know, that you have, you know, so, kind of both of those those steps in? Yeah, in so business decisions, where it comes is that certain times of day, you have certain features or functionality that there is a traffic at a particular part of time, right? And then you want to not do that at that time because you don't want to like uh, hit the traffic and you want to make a change during that time. That is when that comes in and then you schedule that uh, later on, actually. yeah. Yeah, I think maybe a follow-up question for me is, when we talked about technical business decisions, but you know, security is obviously a, a, an important choice. Is that, um, how, how do you kind of handle some of those things and from a security perspective, make sure that things are you know, being deployed you know, appropriately? It is like, uh, so security, when we talk about security, it comes from ground up actually, right? I, I think there are like three or four questions I could answer with this one question actually. So someone brought in this question, like, how are you scanning the code, right? So when you say talk about, you have to start from where the code is checking, scanning, right? So we are using J for artifactory for binary repository and they have a X-ray for binary and artifact scanning. It starts from there, right? That's the first level of scanning. And then uh, we have other tools as CodeQL and SonarCube to do that as well. So that is the first level of thing. Then second level, that, that's where someone, uh, there was this Terraform state question that came actually. I could try to answer it now. Uh, so Terraform, um, basically you have that, uh, we when we had, when we set up, like you can have Terraform enterprises that you have Sentinel rules that you can put it inside so that people cannot break certain rules. Like you have security groups, uh, that you have, this is what security groups, you cannot break in that. If you put a PR in with, the, with those rules, your PR is not go, it's going to fail actually, right? You cannot make the change. And that is what Terraform Enterprise Sentinel brings you, guard rights into that. So that is like second level. You have first level where code scan, second level where you have this guard rails, where you have all your uh, basic rules covered in the Terraform Enterprise. We have dinghy modules. We have all this covers what we do. And, and uh, basically those, are how we do, and then, then, then Spinnaker itself brings this R back and all these things, right? Like who can do what, right? Uh, it's like a person can, a person does not like. We know who is going to deploy and who is going to make the choices. So that is like I would say three or four levels of layers of security that has to be baked. You cannot get that at one level actually. So it has to be done at all different levels. Yeah, thanks for answering that. I think you know what we've seen is you know companies all want to move faster, but there's you know these these guardrails, as you said, that need to be in place in order to enable the organization to do that um, as well. So, um, all right, thanks. Uh, so we've got another question around you know how do you enforce standards across all applications, or do you um, for for the enterprise? Um, so it is a bit tricky actually, right? So when you have an enterprise, um, uh, the standards, uh, you need standards because that is when um, you have to, you have to have a fine balance between standards and freedom for engineers to do things. Actually, it's a fine line you have to do, but I would say DevOps as a team when you do, standards is key actually. So standards, how do you implement uh, in an organization is that you show the added value, right? Um, so if, if uh, let us say, you work on like you, your team, you have only two or three services, right? And then you want to onboard certain people uh, in your team, a new engineer comes in and then you you can only look at your application service. DevOps needs to come in and help you in deployment. You need to be consistent with the standards, right? Only then they can help you. Otherwise they won't be able to help you. So the standards, if you really want to scale and then you want to like just focus on your domain, uh, the standards really help actually. So this is basically how it has to be like uh, evolved in an organization so that when they see that, they see, wow, it really saves time. I don't have to do all this stuff because the standards are there. If I follow this, I don't have to worry about deployment. I just work on my code part and then I can focus on that stuff actually. And uh, that is 
that is what I've seen uh, in my experience, basically. If anyone else wants to add, they can go ahead. I, I can talk about an example. <clears throat> so we have a team uh, that every time they did try to deploy something, it, it would take about 30 minutes. And we we gave them, we, we helped them set up their CD pipeline. And uh, they saw their application go from dead to production in less than 30 minutes. And if you show the engineers, um, I guess, results um, or how much time they're saving, like Vivek mentioned earlier, they wouldn't have a problem um, adhering to some of the standardization that we are requesting the teams to follow so that we can better help not just debug, but deploy faster. Um, so yeah, that's just one another example that I wanted to talk about. All right, great. Yeah, I think um, one of the things you talked about, Song, is, is really, you know, the goal of the team was to, you know, if there is an incident or, you know, some kind of failure, it's, it's that, the application, right, and instead of the pipeline, and if you can, you know, build that trust with your, you know, developers. I think, like you said, you kind of they're probably much more um, willing to, you know, follow a standard or something like that. So, um, all right, cool. So we we've got uh, another question. It's it's a bit long. Let me know if you want me to kind of repeat it here. So can can you go into more detail about the problem with Terraform State? You know why you had the problem and what you were needing to do specifically that Terraform could not do well, um, and then how it was solved in the new tooling. Um, it seems that Spinnaker Red Black only works with replica sets and rollbacks only work with deployments. So, if doing Red Black, um, can you actually do a rollback? Uh, I can talk about this. Um, so. Uh, two different things uh one of the things that vivek mentioned i think was uh we we have, we utilize aws for our secrets and we do um define them through terraform um although the C so i forget when it got introduced but currently if you create secrets through a terraform enterprise there is a way to hide the credentials which is the key reason why we're doing that. Um, so that's required as apps are deploying and they need to fetch some secrets from Secrets Manager in AWS. Um, on the other hand, this question about red black deployments and oh, yeah, I didn't spend too much on the time on this one during the slide, but the way that Spinnaker does their red black deployments is through replica sets, as mentioned in the question, um, it's different from the uh, Kubernetes rollout strategy um, in, in the sense that Red Black will deploy version A and then uh, let's say that version A exists and then you deploy another one, it will come as uh, uh, version B and there is a traffic switch that happens through a match label from a pod perspective and so uh, that's how we do a shift in traffic. And it only does that well when the re replica sets or the pods that have come up with a new version are passing all the health checks, readiness pro, uh, all that. Unless it, it is actually healthy from a uh, pro perspective, it will, not, it will not be a successful deploy. Traffic will not go to the new version. And we the way we've set up is that we we give a time frame for the deployments to succeed and if it succeeds within that time frame you can go ahead but if it fails then we do an automatic rollback to the previous version and what that means is we're switching back the traffic to the previous version hopefully that made sense um if you have a little bit more question maybe um th yeah there's a doc on that and so right. if you would just to kind of follow up with that last part, so we're able to do a rollback even when we're doing red black deployments. Uh, could you repeat that question again? So if we're doing red black deployments, we can still do a rollback with this solution. Oh yes, definitely. And we, yeah, a bunch of our um, applications are doing uh, our rollback in this red black strategy today with replica sets. 
All right, so we got one last question. I know this is um, something that, you know, I, I'm assuming a lot of people are kind of interested in is, have you been able to track the more frequent deployments to, you know, increase in profits or some other, you know, business KPI? Well, uh, productivity, right? So basically, engineering productivity, we are able to track, like, how we do is that. Um, basically, I think that is the key, actually. Like, PRs, um, how many PRs comes from uh, the productivity basically comes, like, how many PRs? It's basically, engineer's life is, like, code, and then how many PRs you do. And we are seeing that, actually. And then I would say uh, the PRs uh, have increased um, over time because when you have... Your code going faster. You write. You tend to write more code because you are not stuck on deployment. Actually, I would say that is one key thing. Actually, which I think anyone can measure that in their pipeline or in their cycle where you see um, where what happened before and what happens now. And when you remove all the bot bottlenecks, uh, the pipeline goes. It's like uh, there's like a, you give a freeway rather than all the lanes they go. They go faster actually. So that's basically one of the key takeaway that we can easily measure. Actually. All right, thanks. Thanks for that. So um, I think that's all the time we have for, for questions. I know that there's you know still a few that were there. Sorry we didn't get to them. Um, last announcement before we go into the the drawing. Uh, we uh, Armory AWS and, and Ernan has have kind of teamed up for a case study that should be coming out um, sometime about mid mid August. So keep an eye out. It's going to have a little bit more details um, around this journey that the the team went through and, and the organization as a whole in terms of, you know, doing this migration. And so um, let us know uh, if, you know, it, when you get that email, um, you know, keep an, keep an eye out for that to, to get more information uh, from us and, and really from for everybody here on the webinar. Thanks a lot for, for showing up and, and participating in the Q&A. Now we'll uh, give it back over to Charles to do the, uh, the, the drawings. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. And uh, that was some great information, guys. It's amazing you could accomplish so much with such a small team. You know, you mentioned 25 to 1. So that's uh, uh, really uh, makes it makes things uh, smooth, it sounded like. Uh, I definitely picked up a few uh, nuggets of information. And I'm going to have to read up on Dingy as uh, pipeline as code. That was one area that uh, uh, hit my interest. But as uh, Adam mentioned, it's now time for the announcement of the $25 Amazon gift card recipients. And so they are Wayne L, Kimberly M, Monique F, and Carla R. Now you will receive an email at the email address that you registered for this webinar with. And if you're like me and you have seven email addresses, you need to check them all. You know, the email will explain how to collect the gift. So don't forget to check your spam filter also. <music>